do it separately. Because Tracy gave Tracy gave us that. Dave, can you hear us at all? Dave Talbot. Hello. Hello. Hey, Bob. How Bob, how, how are you doing? Oh, there you are. Fancy car setting. <laughs> nice. I like it. <laughs> You're cruising. That's great. Oh, oh, yeah. Wait, when I'm doing this, you guys better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, oh, we've got everybody except Phil and uh, Dave Talbot. We can't hear you for some reason. Oh, we can hear him. He can't hear us. Oh, you can't hear us, Dave? Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID. Follow Dave's going to dial in, so he'll be all right. Enter your participant ID followed by pound. Otherwise, check. He's going to need to have to mute his computer, so we'll okay. do that once he gets on. Well, I'll tell him. Dave? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm on the phone, so the, I use the phone option. Hey, uh, Bob. I'm driving. Uh, when I'm doing this, driving? it's going to be trouble. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Where are you on your way to? Okay, I'm, I'm, let's see. It's 732. I'm going, going to call to the Cop? meeting order. I don't know where Phil is. He's probably, oh, he's coming from the cab meeting, probably. Is that extending longer, Tracy? It should be done any minute now. Um, so I, I think everybody will join in any second, but okay. we can start if you want. Why don't we go ahead and start and then they can join in as we go through. I'm uh, calling the meeting to order of the Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners. Um, this meeting of the Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners is being recorded via Zoom for distribution to the community television stations in Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items of the official agenda as well as on items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD Board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chair to maintain order in all public comment of in, or ensuing discussion. And uh, Phil Pacino will be the, uh, the board secretary. Uh, we've got some uh, guests here tonight. Gail, welcome. Gail Thank Page. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's good nice to be to here. You. And I think uh, John Rogers had uh, also said that he was going to try to participate as well, uh, but I don't see him on the Zoom yet. Uh, we're still missing some people from uh, from the uh, uh, CAB meeting, which is, uh, is just wrapping up now. So let's give them perhaps just a minute uh, to see if they can join us. Uh, Phil uh, Pacino, welcome to the, the meeting. Yes, I was just in the CAB meeting, so. Yes, absolutely. I don't know if it was my turn or not, but you know, I got nothing better to do tonight, so I went. <laughs> oh, we, we have a video of you though this time, Phil. Yeah. This is great. This is great. I'm in the modern it's, age now. I got Absolutely. I got <laughs> and of course, you're our appointed board secretary. Thank you very yes. much. Um, we have, as I mentioned, a, a guest or two tonight, uh, which uh, I have not, a couple have not showed up yet. And I think we're waiting for Colleen to sign in as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, Hello, Hamid. Hi, Hamid, how, are how are you? Not bad, thank you. Good. Yeah, she's gonna join us in a few seconds. She just was done. We were just Good. done with the CAP meeting. Great, great. Citizens Advisory Board for the layman. <laughs> I 
spoke to uh, Karen uh, Herrick earlier today. She said she might not be able to make the meeting tonight because of uh, another meeting she has to be at. But uh, if she shows up, that'd be great. So uh, as liaison uh, from the um, board of selectmen. Uh, John, just uh, FYI, I, I might go blank on my video for a while. Okay, sure, Rob. Like That's no problem. Audio. We don't want you to be in an accident, so whatever you have to do, do it, obviously. Yep. Doesn't look like you're moving very fast there. It's, that's what happens when you go about 200. Everything just stands still. <laughs> <laughs> right. Is that where you get your best Wi-Fi, Robert, in your driveway? Exactly. <laughs> where I get my neighbor's best Wi-Fi. <laughs> This is uh, somewhat unusual that uh, people are having either difficulty signing in or that we're a little bit late getting started. It's just a little bit strange. What are you waiting for now, John? Uh, well, see, Phil was here. Phil, are you still here? Yeah, he's still here. Okay, good. I think we're good to go. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, is Colleen here? Yeah. Here. Oh, good. I'm sorry, I didn't see you in the uh, in the uh, in the picture. Sorry. And we have George. We have George Hooper too. You might not have your full screen shot oh. there. What yeah, are you using yeah. your phone, John? Little screen or something? No, I'll go, I'll go to gallery view. There we go. There we go. Now I've got everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah, I didn't see everybody coming in. Yeah, we just left our meeting. Oh, good. George, hello. Good. To, always a pleasure to hey, John. Uh, with us. Uh, and I mentioned John Rogers was uh, signing in as well. Yeah, uh, he's here. John, pleasure to have you here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we've got everyone else. We talked about Gail. And I think everyone's here, so this is great. So why don't we get started? I already read the uh, opening remarks. Uh, we talked about Phil, and um, Phil, do you um, have any comments uh, on the cab meeting you just came from? Yeah, I, I attended the meeting. I, like I said, I don't know if it was my turn to attend, but you know, I had nothing better to do, so I decided I'd attend tonight. <laughs> uh, basically, we, we kind of went over the, uh, the minutes. There was the general manager's report, the audit report, Chuck David report. There's also a, um, a presentation on the small cell wireless, which we're gonna get in this meeting also. Uh, it was very informative um, going forward at this point. They also elected a uh, new chair going forward, Jason Small, and the vice chair will be Vivek going forward from now on. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for that report. Uh, we don't have any liaisons, as I mentioned before, to the uh, Board of uh, Selectmen from Reading. So we'll, we'll go past that. We'll move directly into public public comment. And um, if, let's see, I believe that uh, there are a couple of places you, we could have public comment here uh, from the Grace uh, Group. They had sent a letter uh, to us uh, making certain requests. And um, what I'd like to do is put a more in-depth um, sort of answer or answers from them. Um, in our September meeting, but in the meantime, we could talk a little bit, perhaps tonight, uh, even during uh, Chuck's presentation, which will deal with some of the uh, climate change um, uh, related uh, issues. Um, but I think that the the two that are of concern to me, I think to the other commissioners as well, is that we would like to make a request to uh, the Grace Group uh, to basically um, if you feel that the IOUs uh, have, uh, I think you used the words uh, transparent, I've got the letter here somewhere, um, uh, criteria in terms of, um, let me just uh, find it as a matter of fact. Um, we would adopt a policy of parity with the investor owned utilities, hitting the same annual targets for renewable and clean energy and reporting progress under the same rules. That was sort of one thing that we we would like you to define for us. In other words, tell us 
what you think those policies are. Um, and I, you, know, you know that we're not an IOU, we are not a multi-billion dollar corporation. Uh, and, they, and Chuck will delve a little bit into some of those differences and why those are very important to us. And there was another comment in the letter saying that we'd be willing to pay for a rate increase to accomplish this. And uh, we have developed some numbers, as you know, to suggest what that rate increase would be for us to move along our track as opposed to uh, the track of any IOU, because we frankly don't know what the IOUs are, are really doing because we don't compare ourselves with them specifically. Um, the, the only thing I would caution you on, and I have done this in every single meeting that I've been here at the RMLD, is that we're very, very sensitive to any rate increases because people are unemployed, people are on fixed income, and our charter says we try to provide the lowest possible cost to our customers. And now that doesn't mean that we don't pursue other things that will incur a cost and maybe some innovative ways of dealing with that. Uh, but I would just want you to be aware that cost is one of our primary goals to remaining uh, who we are as an organization for all of our communities. And it's not just Reading, as you know, it's North Reading, Linfield, Wilmington, et cetera, and, as well as Reading and all the businesses uh, that are involved there too. So we, we take it extremely seriously whenever anyone says, just raise the rates a little bit. We don't necessarily do that. So we need really, really great justification <laughs> from you to you know, prove us to us with data uh, we need data behind your letter is what I'm trying to say. And I would open that up to yourself right now and to our other commissioners. Thank you, John. Uh, I always so appreciate your um, openness and your presentation. And I uh, so welcome the opportunity for us to understand, like I'm looking forward to Chuck's presentation where he'll help us understand um, what, you're, what you are dealing with and, and so forth. And I, I understand that cost has historically been a major concern of yours um, in terms of protecting your customers. And I noticed uh, I, was, I was on your website and exploring your history a little bit. And I noticed that last year was your 125th um, birthday celebration. Yeah, that is so yeah, We don't look that old, do we? <laughs> I all. <hope. No. laughs> So you know, we're still accepting home. gifts, Gail. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> Phil. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have a gift. We have a gift, uh, and I'll, I'll speak more about it. Um, I don't know. I ha I have something written up that I wanted to to I think would explain some of the good rationale for our request. And I don't know whether you want me to do that now or hold it until public comment. Well, we're kind of into public comment, but if you could hold it to just a couple of minutes, uh, that would be really appropriate. And okay. in the meantime, by the way, Jim. Uh, uh, Satter, wait, uh, welcome. I see you signed in. Thanks, Jeff. So go ahead, Gail. Okay. Um, all right. So <laughs> this is kind of awkward because it's kind of flowed differently. So this is something I've written. I wish I could just speak more extemporaneously, but I wanted to be sure I said everything that I, I wanted to say. So uh, forgive me for a little formality here. So good evening. My name is Gail Page, and I am here as chair of the Green Sanctuary Climate Justice Group of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Reading, and as coordinator of the Greater Reading Alliance for Clean Energy, or GRACE. I hope uh, the commissioners and Colleen and Chuck all received the letter, the steering committee um, emailed to you earlier in the week, and that you've had a chance to read it. Um, I would like to share my thoughts about um, the request GRACE expressed at the at the last Board of Commissioners meeting and in the letter. So first, um, I have great respect and admiration for the Reading Municipal Light Department. Through the leadership of many commissioners and staff through the years, you have done an admirable job of meeting your mission, providing safe, reliable, and competitively priced electricity to your customers along with good customer service. Your financial balance sheet is remarkably strong and the depth of knowledge and future planning skills demonstrated by your general manager, Colleen, and your director of integrated services, Chuck, are impressive. Um, but times have changed. And, and, and actually, when I read about the, um, your birthday, it talked about 125 years you've had the same mission. Um, and I'm thinking that maybe 
it's time for a change. It has been historical, this, this, the mission you have been living by and that you've been living by so well, but um, there's a, been a big change and that is the climate crisis, which is upon us in force. Um, I hope that you are all among the many people who recognize that we as uh, humanity is at a tipping point. Either we do what is needed now to turn back the climate crisis or we become accomplices in the worsening of the crisis. The climate crisis unaddressed ends in humanity paying a terrible price in human suffering, loss of life and environmental destruction, as well as financially. Stopping the use of carbon emitting fuels is one critical part of reversing climate change. Historically, electricity has been created from the burning of carbon emitting fossil fuels. Our best hope for the future is a three step process. Having all electricity generated from clean, renewable, non carbon emitting sources. Electrifying heating, cooling, cooking and transportation and reducing electricity usage through energy efficiency measures. You as leaders of an electric power plant are ideally placed to play a significant role in the solution to climate change. Grace asks that you take on this challenge. That is why we made our request that at the least we want the RMLD to meet both the renewable portfolio standard and the clean energy standard as clearly defined in law and as mandated for the IOUs. For the future, if the law changes, as seems likely, and different standards are imposed on the IOUs as people realize more and more what's going on with the climate crisis, um, then we want RMLD to comply with the new IOU standards and not just with any weaker standards for which the MLPs may have successfully lobbied, such as the Golden Bill. We are happy to discuss the IO rules with you as you have requested. Um, we also want to understand what obstacles, if any, exist to fulfilling our request. We hope that through communication, mutual understanding and problem solving, we can, you can, we can find ways for RMLD to meet your goals along with the goals required to meet this moment of climate crisis. I want to believe that you, as the leaders of the Reading Municipal Light Department, are concerned enough about the climate crisis that you are willing to do something about it. Thank you. Not bad, Gail. It was like four and a half minutes. It was pretty good. <laughs> you did a good job. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and I think uh, our September meeting, uh, we will put it on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, to have you give us your data, what you feel that the IOUs are responsible for, and why you think that um, we can sort of do, do exactly what they're doing. You're going to see tonight a little bit about uh, some of the differences, so you can incorporate that into your thinking as well. Uh, and by the way, I mean, we, we don't generate power. I, I mean, we, the only thing we really generate power on is is uh, perhaps with solar panels and you know some storage and batteries. We buy power and we distribute it and we service our territories, but we don't own a fossil uh, plant that generates power like the IOUs, a major, major difference. And you'll see some of that in Chuck's presentation tonight. Okay, any other uh, comments? Uh, if not, uh, I'd like to move on to the... Uh... Unmute, I'm, unmute Jim. Jim is raising his hand. Oh, Jim, I'm sorry. I didn't see you, Jim. Yeah. Uh, hi, John. Um, yeah, th thanks for your comments. I just wanted to respond to your request to us for data. I'm not quite sure what you're asking for because essentially we're asking what the IUs need to do is they need to comply with the renewable portfolio standard and the clean energy standard. Those requirements are spelled out explicitly in law, it's, it, it's, it is a transparent public process. It's not some secret data that, that we have that we can provide you. And in fact, Chuck fully understands all of those rules. At the last board meeting, he presented slides which showed 
how much extra it would cost for uh, in, in coming years for the RMLD to meet the CES and to meet the RPS. He's crunched those numbers already by the fact that those that um, he was able to compare them to something that means that the RMLD is currently following their policy and by the fact that um, the numbers were positive to get to the RPS and the CES, not significant really, I don't think, but they were somewhat positive to get to those numbers that indicates that the RMLD is currently doing less according to the standards of the CES and the RPS than what the oh, RMLD Jim, if I, if I may, uh, thank you, but um, I'm, we've been participating and providing you with in, uh, lots of data, and lots of analysis, et cetera, about what we're doing and how we're trying to meet this. I want you, I want you to come back and show us what you think the IOUs are doing, what the data sources are that you're using. I want to see the numbers that you believe, not, not getting the numbers from us to say then that we're not meeting them. I want you as a committee to go and look at the numbers and come back and share those with us and do a de definitive analysis of what you think the IOUs are doing. And then we'll compare with what we think they're doing and I, I need you to be more involved. I need you to be more involved in this than just making requests from, uh, this is a, be a nice thing to do. We, we would love to be able to do anything that anyone requests of us, but there's a cost to doing it, not just in terms of the money, the time and everything else. And we've been trying to do that. But I think it's incumbent upon Grace to go back and really define specifically what the IOUs are doing and why you think they are doing a much better job than what we're doing. Now, I'm, we'll put that as an agenda item on the September agenda for you to have for, to, for the presentation to us about that. Is that, does okay. that, is that clear? Uh, all right, thanks, John. Great, thank you. Can I, can I could I also speak? Uh, yes. This is, this is John Rogers. I am also uh, involved with the Greater Reading Alliance for Clean Energy, Grace. So thank you, thanks for your time. And I'll, uh, I'll second what Gail has said, our appreciation for everything RMLD has done around clean energy. And you all, I have appeared before you before, uh, and you know that, uh, and I have enumerated the many ways that you all have pushed forward a, uh, a clean energy uh, agenda. And I recognize, uh, as John Stempek says, you know, you're, you're coming at this from a cost perspective. And I will point out, Gail mentioned the three areas that Grace is interested in working with you on. And one of those is energy efficiency. You, I know that RMLD long ago recognized the, the financial value, value of, of energy efficiency, even though it would look to some as like a, a reduction in load and customers. Uh, the second is electrification, which is a newer effort but I know you all have been thinking about this, you know, EV, EV chargers and now getting into right. heat pumps and other electrification. The third one is clean energy. Uh, I will say, uh, I, I've, I've got to agree with Jim, the numbers are not hard to come up with. I mean, we can tell you what the, uh, what the IOUs are, the, the standards they're expected to meet and they don't own power plants either like you, you know, they're selling, they're, they're principally pass throughs, but they are required to have uh, renewable energy or, or RECs, uh, they are, they are required to have RECs to, to prove that they have met those standards. And that I think is, um, and we will see, I think in Chuck's presentation later, we'll see a discussion of those. Uh, what I don't, what I haven't seen, what I didn't see in Chuck's presentation earlier um, at the, at the cab meeting was what would it take to actually meet the standards? Not what is it, what are the cost implications of selling all the RECs you have? But what are the cost implications of selling the RECs, if I understood correctly? What are the cost implications of selling only, uh, only, uh, sorry, of retiring all the RECs you have or retiring only those RECs you would need to meet, to meet those standards? And those, those are different. Uh, sure. I will say I can, uh, we are willing to provide more information about RECs since I know from past interactions with the board that there's some confusion about what it means to hold and retire RECs or to sell them. And so we're happy to provide some resources around that because this is, that is probably the largest sticking point. Uh, you know, if you're buying wind and then selling the recs, you no longer have wind, you can't claim it as wind. That's, that should be pretty clear and clear in case law and all. So um, 
that's that's going to be an important distinction. So that we're okay. happy to share resources. Okay, thank you, John. And if if, if these numbers are in data are so available, we look forward to seeing the presentation in September from the group. Sure. And we would really like to see that. Um, I mean, there's a. I'm not going to belabor this much more, <laughs> but we there's a very historical context to this whole rec question, which goes back about ten years, uh, and there was incredible division within the four towns. Phil, you remember this? Uh, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and uh, the overwhelming majority of the communities wanted to sell the wrecks. I'm just telling you that is historical perspective. It wasn't, I mean, times have changed. You're absolutely right in terms of what we need to do for clean energy, et cetera. But I'm going to tell you that back then uh, it was about significant, and not small, significant cost differences in terms of retiring wrecks or holding on to wrecks. So, but we're going to deal with a little bit of that. I mean, we're open to looking at it. That's, that's, and times change, as Gail said, and I completely agree. When times change, you need to readjust your mission if it needs to be readjusted and tweaked. So we're totally open to doing that. But at the end of the day, you know, we serve four communities. We don't serve a minority of those communities. We serve the majority of those communities. And we have to be very careful mm -hmm. that we, we do that. So I hope you understand our position. It's not, the board of commissioners having you know a, a, an idea one way or the other that they want to support it's we're trying to be responsive to all the people and all the businesses in each one of our communities is that fair okay sure okay. Yeah, i i think we can return to that rec question next next month because wonderful uh, and sure. john thank I, you for your, thank you for your openness and your willingness to talk with us and to work together i'm I'm thrilled and delighted, and we look forward to working with you next, next Thank month. Thank you. Let me just turn off this light back here. Just thank you. Um, okay, good. So if we could, uh, I believe there are no approval of minutes. They're still being reviewed. Mr. Is that Chair, correct? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, a point of personal privilege. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Phil. Yes, please. Yeah. I just want to acknowledge that uh, Jim Blomley passed away last oh, month. Oh, yes. Yes, Jim thank you. He was a uh, longtime RMLD employee for 42 years. At one point, he was the assistant manager, and when he retired, he was a, uh, the pro a project manager. And I just think, uh, you know, I think it's appropriate for the board to send along his condolences to his family, his, uh, his wife, Donna, who herself is a retired RMLD employee also at this point. And I think I speak for all the board to pass our condolences on to the family, to Donna and all the family of, of Jim Blumley. And I want to recognize him for, you know, and thank him for his service for over the years, for 40, 42 years he served the RMLD. It's fantastic. And I think it would be appropriate for the board to acknowledge, acknowledge his, his death and, and send our condolences to the family. Thank you very much, Phil. That, that's excellent. Um, if we could move on to the general manager's report, um, Colleen. Hi, um, I'm just going to speak a little bit about uh, the budget. And um, according to the 20 year agreement, uh, we, um, we need to get the budget to the CAV by October 1st. And uh, we've been working on the budget since July and um, we're going through the capital and then it goes through the expense and power supply and, um, and we should have it ready. We're not expecting any major changes in our budget other than uh, pushing uh, the substation again in some AI, AMI metering uh, we've decided to ask a consultant to has, uh, help us with the conversion since the technology is changing so quickly. Uh, so those are the only two items that I think that will, you know, that are, will be major on there. Um, and so uh, I believe October 15th was the day that the cab picked in the meeting before here. Last year, um, we did the expense and capital in the same night. I thought it went very well. I think you guys all thought it went very well. I'd like to recommend to do that again. Um, so uh, we don't do the cab and, and the board meeting on the same night, obviously, but uh, I think the cab picked October 15th. So it would be after that. So I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that right now and have Tracy pick a day uh, to uh, get that uh, scheduled. Do, do the commissioners have any uh, uh, feelings one way or the other about what date would be good to to review the budget? I'm assuming after the after the cab, you're saying, right, Colleen? Yes. 
So that would be a, a, a separate meeting from the our, our general meeting on a monthly basis? Uh, no, we usually do, uh, am I right, Tracy? We usually do it at the regular meeting, correct? That's what I remember, but- Yeah, I think we do everything together. It's a long meeting, but right. we do everything. Okay, then, then why don't we just plan on doing that at our regular October meeting? Okay. Unless anyone has objections. Okay, uh, good. Uh, anything else, Colleen? Uh, no, we, we have a, a couple of presentations to give, so I'm just going to pass the baton from here. That's really all okay, I had great. to add. Thank you. So we're into the small, small cell wireless. Um, Mr. McDonough, I didn't recognize you to begin with, but hi. Good to see you. <laughs> good evening. How are you? So I just want to um, have a high level presentation or discussion about what's coming towards us uh, in the very near future regarding wireless communication and uh, the installation and uh, propagation of 5G signaling. Um, uh, Tracy, can I get the uh, next page? So uh, what prompted all of this really is the change in the FCC regulation. So the FCC has now classified wireless communication companies as utility companies, like an electric utility or a, um, a hardwired communication uh, company such as Comcast or Verizon. So uh, with that, with that change, uh, wireless companies can now leverage the FCC guidelines uh, to and start to start installing small cell wireless facilities, which is 5G in public and private rights of way within our communities. Now, uh, they, they still need to apply uh, to these municipal communities for the installation of this wireless equipment. Uh, there is a, a legal argument that the FCC orders pertaining to these small cell wireless facilities don't actually apply to RMLD. Uh, but uh, I believe it's in the best interest that uh, RMLD uh, is working in good faith to accommodate this new technology. This, this new technology is coming, uh, whether some people like it or not, uh, it's coming, it's going to be here for the foreseeable future. Uh, and then we also have our master agreement, which does not hold a, a shot clock, if you will, a, a basketball reference, apparently. Um, but, you know, we still work with the wireless communication companies um, and to have, you know, 60 day timeframes to respond uh, to properly completed applications and 30 days from uh, those completed applications to complete the work if any work should be required. Tracy, can I get the next one? So permitting, and this both uh, applies to the municipality of the community and the RMLD. So each wireless company needs to apply to each municipality, the town itself, and be granted permission to install that wireless facility in public and private right of ways within that community. That's the first step for these wireless companies. So much like when Comcast came in so many years ago, they needed to uh, be granted permission from the municipality or the community to install their facilities within the public right of way, uh, namely on, on the utility poles. Now, uh, once a wireless company is granted permission from the municipality or the community to install their equipment in the right of way, that wireless company also needs to enter into agreement with RMLD through its pole license agreement process and its joint owner. So as everyone knows, uh, within the four towns that we service, we're joint owners on those poles with Verizon. Now, some of those poles are, are Verizon are the custodians of those poles, and some of those poles, uh, Reading Light is the custodian of those poles. But regardless, the wireless company still needs to have an agreement with both parties. Whoever the joint owners are, they need to have an agreement with them before any work or before any application can be made. And then once uh, the wireless company, A, has the permission or the permit from the municipality to install, and they've signed an agreement with the joint owners of that facility, then they can start making application to the RMLD to install some of their wireless facilities. Now they can apply 
for up to 10 licenses per application. So each installation of a wireless facility requires a license. There will be one wireless facility on a pole that will require one license. They may apply for 10 licenses at one time. And then once they apply, that's when RMLD will start its work. And uh, Tracy, can I get to the next slide? We have a uh, we have a process flow here of how it's all going to work. So uh, once we have all the applications and uh, the agreements in place and permits in place, the wireless company will make application to Reading Light. Uh, that application will be assigned to one of our engineers. Once our engineer receives that application, they will now first and foremost notify the respective community of that application. So if they're applying for Reading, Reading gets notified of the actual applications and their locations. And the same goes for Wilmington, North Reading, and Linfield as well. He will notify the town. And that's very, and I'll, I'll get into why, but that's very important of why we need to have this uh, open line of communication with each community. So once they apply, you know, we just double check to make sure that they have permit within the town to be in the right of way. And uh, they have a current master agreement signed or entered into with Reading Municipal Light. Assuming all of that stuff is in place and correct and proper, then we start getting into our analysis. So we'll start looking at the pole location that they want to start installing this wireless facility on. Now, uh, specifically, we're looking at pole loading information. Some of this equipment can and will be heavy. And we need to make sure that our structure can handle the added load or the added stress to that facility. And we perform uh, that calculation through a software that we have called Pole Foreman. Pole Foreman looks specifically at those types of uh, stresses and loads on the poles. Now, uh, depending on the custodian of the pole, like I mentioned, Verizon is the custodian of some poles, Reading is custodian of others. Depending on who the custodian is, and if the pole is sufficient, maybe that pole needs to be replaced. If that pole needs to be replaced to a larger pole or a higher class pole to accommodate the additional loading, either Reading or Verizon would need to replace that. Uh, Reading and Verizon have uh, a process in place for the replacement of poles, uh, uh, official notification through a uh, 605 form um, poll petitions would need to be required uh, if we're going outside of the uh, three foot boundary of the existing poll. But all of that will still follow the very same process we have for poll replacements within the service territory that we have, depending on who the custodian is. Now, uh, once we look at the analysis of this poll, and depending on what they're trying to install, where, Reading Light may have to do some work in order to accommodate this new signaling system. And that could be as simple as rearranging some facilities on the pole to create additional space, or it could be as complex as replacing the pole to a uh, pole in, uh, taller in height or uh, wider in class to accommodate the new load. Now, uh, Reading will supply the wireless company with an estimate of the work that needs to be performed in order to accommodate their new equipment. And they will have to pay Reading Light in order to uh, provide those changes or provide those updates. Once those changes are agreed upon and signed and paid, we'll perform the work. Reading Light will perform that work on our facilities and make that poll ready. So that's also known as make ready work. So they'll make that poll ready for the installation of the new wireless facility. Once we have all of that completed, we will uh, inform the wireless company that this pole is ready for the installation of their facility and their wireless equipment. Now, the wireless company has two options as far as who they can actually have install that equipment. They can contract with Reading Light to have that work done, and we can install the equipment for them, or they can subcontract to a qualified third party line company that would be able to install that equipment for them. Now, uh, even with getting a third party or having Reading do it, we have within our master agreements, a set of specifications that need to be followed 
and that will be inspected after the installation of that equipment. So they must follow the Reading Lights specification guidelines. We have a set of drawings. There's quite a few of them, as a matter of fact, uh, approximately 40 different drawings that we had uh, completed just for this process so they could follow all of these guidelines. So uh, once they have that equipment installed, naturally uh, Reading Light will inspect it to make sure that it is proper and it is following our guidelines and we can go from there. Now, Reading Light will also notify the towns upon the completion of that work. Uh, Tracy, can I get the next slide, please? Before you, before you go off that slide, can I ask a question? Go back to that slide. It seems, and I saw this presentation at the CAB meeting. It seems to me there's, we're gonna be involved with the cost here. I don't okay. think anybody's addressed, I don't, you may have addressed it, John, I may have missed it earlier, but it seems to me there's gonna, the IMLD is gonna have a cost here to do some of it, even if we, even if it's done by a third party at this point. Is there any addressing here as to the cost of the RMLD getting reimbursed for these costs? Yes, absolutely. So there's application fees for us to even perform the analysis and any work that needs to be performed on that pole to accommodate this new equipment, the wireless company is paying for it. So it's not going to uh, generate a cost directly to the RMLD to get this facility installed. It will be at their cost. Okay, would that include the inspection cost that you'll have to go and inspect this thing? Part of the application. by a third party? Uh, even if the work's done by a third party, yeah. Our, the engineer who receives the, uh, who receives the project, once the installation is complete, will go out and take a look at it. So the inspection for the actual installation won't be significant, um, but it still needs to be done to make sure that it is, uh, that it meets our specifications. But all of that is is incorporated into the make ready work and the application fees. Okay. Right. Uh, good questions, Phil. Uh, John, just a, on a follow up of that, if if you had uh, T Mobile and AT and T and Verizon and three others uh, all wanting to put equipment on a pole, um, how how do you decide who puts the equipment on a pole, or do they do it? The next pole down, they put their equipment on, and the third one puts it next pole down. Yeah, it's first come, first serve. And then, um, so if AT and T applies and we grant a license to AT and T, that pole is theirs, uh, or they have the license to that pole. Naturally, we would be we wouldn't be able to uh, to give another license to another company to install the very same equipment on that pole. You but thirty feet away, they could install it on a different pole. They, yes, they could. They could put it on a separate pole. Uh, you know, the next section down, they could install their, uh, they could they could get a license for that. Now that's not to say that, you know, RMLD has reserved capacity. So we have equipment that we need to install on some of our poles for switching, large skate mate switches, recloses, capacitor banks, risers, things of that nature. So RMLD will be reserving pole capacity for ourselves, for our own projects to make sure that uh, it's not impacting our ability to conduct business and distribution within our own system. Great, okay, thank you. Now, uh, notifications, this part's very important to us. So uh, the town uh, is requested, so we're asking each individual uh, community to notify RMLD when a wireless company has been granted uh, permission or a permit to install some of their equipment in the public right away. We'd, we'd like to know if that has been given. It's just a heads up so that we know to expect some type of communication from that wireless company regarding a master agreement or attaching onto our facilities. Now, RMLD will also notify the town, and this is to promote communication between the communities and RMLD of each application location and the proposed wireless facility. So we wanna be able to take that application from the wireless company and notify each respective town to say, hey, uh, AT&T has applied for these 10 licenses at this location on these poles. And we're going through the process of, uh, an, uh, of the analysis of that location. So the town knows that applications are in process and that we're looking at them. Now, um, we'll, we'll also notify the town, the status of that application or that license for that location. So it is possible that 
AT&T submits an application for 10 licenses. Uh, and after our analysis is completed, we grant AT&T nine licenses because one pole either is reserved capacity for RMLD's express use, or there's an issue with the actual location that we're not able to provide them with a license. Now, grant you, uh, RMLD will make every effort to work with the wireless company uh, in order to get their facility in, even if it's you know picking a separate uh, location for their wireless facility, other than the one that they they were originally requesting. So you know we'll be working with them uh, in order to uh, accommodate their needs for their propagation. So 5G is line of sight. So they're going to want to be able to have their facilities in direct line of sight with one another in order for these things to communicate. And if we can't get one of their wireless facilities at their requested location, we'll certainly work with them to get that uh, wireless facility located somewhere that does work for them and uh, that it uh, satisfies their propagation results. Now, uh, it is possible that you know we're, we're unable to accommodate their needs and uh, we grant them the nine and not the 10th license. And in that case, we'll notify the town, let them know, hey, you know, we gave them these nine, uh, but this 10th one, we were unable to accommodate. So just an FYI or a heads up, they may be contacting you so that they can get a poll petition hearing or a request to install their own poll in the right of way. That poll naturally won't have anything to do with RMLD's facility or our distribution efforts, it will be for the express use of that wireless company for their facilities. But we wanna be open and clear with each community, letting them know where these licenses stand or where these applications stand so that they're not receiving information secondhand or through a miscommunication process, thinking that, you know, RMLD just said no and, you know, that's the end of it. We'll be providing the information as to why that application or that license was denied and why we were not able to accommodate that wireless facility at that location. And, you know, alternative locations were not acceptable to the wireless company. But we wanna be able to have that conversation with each individual community regarding these things so we have an open line of communication. Now, uh, a wireless company may also want to install uh, some of their facilities in an area that RMLD doesn't have any facilities. Uh, and whether it be in an underground application or somewhere that we don't have any poles, you know, they may be looking for a pole or some type of structure to have their 5G signaling uh, on the top of. And if we don't have facilities in that area, they're still gonna need electric service in order to supply all of their equipment. And if that's the case, you know, then RMLD may have to get involved with supplying them with some type of electric service. So it is possible that, you know, where they're looking to put a wireless facility, we don't have our facilities there, but they're going to be looking for electric service in that application. And then, you know, that'll that'll open up another conversation about how we're going to get electric service to that location. Can I get the next page, Tracy? Yeah, one one more question here. Go back sure. again. Yep. Sorry, sorry, but you know, I got the preview, so I got questions. <laughs> um, you know, if you install the, if the, if the new pole gets installed, who's responsible for that? If the car hits the pole, is is it? Uh, are you talking on a sole own? Yes. That is up to the wireless company, because they will be the owner of that pole, not RMLD and not Verizon. If RMLD gets called out to replace that pole, what's what's the plan? Is there a plan for that? Uh, if if we have a facility on the pole, like electric service to feed that pole, mm -hmm. what we will do is we will make our equipment safe and we will make it safe for uh, public and our employees. And we'll, you know, we'll remove those those conductors from the area. But Reading Light will not be performing any type of work on that type of installation. That is not our pole. We're not responsible for it. And we're not the custodians of it. Okay. Thank you. John. Uh, I just, may I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, follow up on Phil's question about fees. If there's a slide coming up, then I'll hold off about the fees you're going to charge. But if not, I, I'll ask it now. 
So I, I, I don't have a slide that has the fee schedule associated with it. The fee schedule is laid out within the master agreement. Uh, okay. I don't know if and the committee has had a chance to review that master agreement as of yet. By committee, do you mean us or do you mean somebody else? You guys, the, the board. Okay. So um, d does it just spell out the FCC numbers, the 270 uh, recurring and the, the $100 per poll? Is that the numbers you're using or are you using something else? Yeah, those numbers are, are installed in there. So is that is that like a fixed thing or are you doing a, a, a are you just using those numbers and nothing else? Uh, no, we, we actually had our uh, our own analysis done, which aligned with that. Okay, good. That I just wanted to ask about that because I know there's some just from my the work I do, I'm aware that some there's some confusion on this point that some folks think that these are the the FCC numbers are the only fees you can charge in it, and I guess you already know that if they're not like this um, uh, this hundred dollar application fee. In some jurisdictions, the utility has found that it's actually costing them a thousand. You, know, you laid out the perfect process, and it's very involved. And as Phil pointed out, it costs us a lot of money. That some jurisdictions are able to charge a thousand, or fifteen hundred, or even more, where the FCC says, "Oh, you can charge one hundred, but you have to sit down and justify. You have to walk through and uh, and just stop me. I know, but if, if I'm if I'm saying stuff you already know, and you probably am, but if you can document what your costs are in hours and gas and everything else, you can charge the higher fees. And then you'll be ready if the industry wants to attack you and say you're charging too much, you're gonna have your analysis. So I'm surprised that they came back as as low as that because some other places are charging a lot more than, than the minimum. Can, can so. I add to that? Go ahead, please Colleen. Um, so the way we're doing it, Dave, uh, is we have application fee, uh, we have make ready for all the money yep. that we spend. And then there's the 270 per poll per year for static. Okay. Right. And any of those are going to collect. We are not going to uh, allow our customers to take a loss on any of this. Um, but if you're specifically talking about the static amount for the poll, uh, we're going to leave it at 270 until we can determine that a static installation because just like yep. John says, if a poll gets hit and we have to go out yep. there, and we're going to have their polls clearly marked so they know they're not our polls. Uh, but if we have to go out there, they're going to get a bill. That has nothing to do with the 270 for the static. That's right. That, and that's the annual like rental uh, fee, the 270. But Right. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yep. And even in the, our estimate for the make ready work is going to incorporate the engineering and analysis and inspection of that installation that they have to pay up front before any of that work is completed. Okay, so, so that could be, so you will charge more than the hundred bucks in essence. I mean, you're, yeah, that's just the application fee, that's it. So but even the application fee, you could charge 1500. You, you, people are doing that right now, just so you know. People are charging 1500 for an application fee plus the make ready because they, they can show that the cost, as Phil was saying, when you walk through all that stuff that you're doing and all the communications with the town and the initial site visit, the, the post inspection, all that, you know, it takes forever and a hundred bucks doesn't even come close. And and that's, and I'm not talking about the make ready. I'm talking about all of your overhead and all of your, you know, you, you can charge a lot more than a hundred bucks and other people are charging 10 times that much. Right. And, and we, at the end of the day, we still have to justify those numbers as well. Yes, you do. You do. But I think it could be easy to do. So I think, you know, Phil's on the right track there, you know, that, that you, you but you just have to document all that and then say, hey, man, this is costing us 2000 a poll and you can get the money. And if they challenge you, you're going to have the analysis. That's all. So that's want to make sure that that was uh, I, I, I've come to know a, too, too much. Really important discussion. And I I think that that uh, the commissioners are absolutely right that we need to at a minimum cover all of our costs, including the fully loaded costs. Um, yes. And, and not just like on an hourly basis cost. But wrapped in with all the overhead charges, et cetera. Exactly. Uh, part of that. And John, I'm, I'm sure you're. And don't let it, and because the, the industry has pushed the FCC around, and now the FCC is trying to push us around. But this is the pushback, and and it's also a big revenue opportunity if we push hard. That's all. I just wanted to. Yeah. yeah. If if this were uh, you know a perfect universe, uh, obviously what we'd like to do is put up our own equipment, lease it to them, uh, and they can buy the licenses off of us for 
however much they want. It, I understand we can't it's do a, that. It's a good idea. Wellesley tried it. It was a noble effort. It didn't work out, but yeah. uh, Wellesley Light Department did try that. Uh, in Boston, what you have is like companies like Xnet. You, know, you asked earlier, John, about, or somebody did about, well, what if, you know, ATT today, Verizon tomorrow? Well, then there's companies like Xnet that'll host for all of those. And so then RMLD would just be dealing with Xnet and basically be that middleman, as you described, that maybe we would be. So that's another way that multiple entities could be on one pole through an entity like Xnet. Right, with multiple antennas at the top of it. John, exactly. Uh but just a follow-up question. Obviously, these all these units are going to be using electricity. Um, if you we became saturated in our region, our territory, uh, could you develop some just uh, back of the envelope numbers in terms of how many kilowatt hours we're talking about in terms of usage? Uh, you know what? I haven't seen usage for one single unit yet. Yeah, I, I don't know what they're what each actor is doing, I but you could they're going to be pretty high usage, I think because they're at very high frequencies, as you know, and yes. so the power supplies are going to be using, you know, knowing from my history, they're going to be eating up a lot of power. And I'm just wondering if we can charge them differential rates for that, by the way. Hi, John. Hi, this is Bob. Hi, Bob. Hi, I, you know, just, just you know, along this discussion, I, I deal with this as well every day. Oh, great. Um, one of the one of the numbers that we came up with for the 60 amp service running all year pretty constant we came up with about a four thousand dollar usage for for that just just for a ballpark number you can't really predict what it's going to be up and down because it's because it, it, there's no there's no real number there yet for, for studying but right. just, just, just if you use that as a number that that's one number that we we've, we've thrown around a little bit so that's per poll, Bob? Per, per year. Per year, per poll. Per year, per poll with one, one antenna on it. Oh, excellent. What was, what, was the number, what was the number again, Bob? What was the usage? $4,000. That's what we came up with. Wow. 4000 That's excellent. So let's, uh, let's put an antenna on every poll. That, that, that might come. That, that, was, that might come. <laughs> Okay, sorry. That, 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 that's definitely coming. Exonet, Verizon, everybody. That, that that competition is an onslaught right now to get <laughs> to is. those poles, and it's it, it's absolutely amazing. Every company yeah. wants to be there. So. Yeah, ab absolutely. And you know, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal talking about this earlier this week, and how uh, they were just astounded about how 5G blows away 4G. It's just like not even close. So I see there's going to be a huge rush into this. So. That's great. Mm. Right. Tracy, can I get the uh, next slide? I want to go into some of the aesthetics. So um, concerning aesthetics with these new installations, uh, it's, it's recommended that each town reviews the RMLD's uh, master agreement, which also holds our technical specifications when either creating or reviewing an aesthetic policy so that these two documents align with one another. So we want to have the town's aesthetic policy dovetail in with RMLD's uh, technical specifications regarding this equipment. Now, uh, the town's aesthetic policy will differ clearly from Reading Light's technical specifications. The town's aesthetic policy can cover a wide range of applications and installations, including decorative street lights within the downtown area. Uh, some wireless companies uh, may elect to start changing out some of their streetlight poles in order to turn them into 5G antennas. The, uh, now, naturally, that is outside of RMLD's purview, but um, th that, that needs to follow the aesthetic policy. Also, in some applications, they may be looking to install some of these antennas on buildings, which also would need to fall under the aesthetic policy that the town creates and implements. Uh, but uh, we think that the two policies should dovetail with one another and align with one another so that the two policies aren't contradicting one another. Now, RMLD will uh, help review each aesthetic policy and provide comment on that to ensure that they are um, aligned and that we don't have any type of contradictions within those two policies. We will certainly work with the town in order to get an aesthetic policy created and so that it works well for everybody involved. 
Um, Tracy. So here's a, uh, this is just a quick ep excerpt from our master agreement and the technical specifications that we had created. So we have approximately 40 drawings um, at the end of our master agreement, which uh, cover a wide range of installations and applications that pertain to RMLD's distribution area. So on uh, sheet COM 35-1 is a typical installation uh, with a three phase primary on top and a primary lateral showing the antenna at the top of the pole. Naturally, everything is specced out as far as heights, distances, where things can be located, uh, and then uh, having their uh, radio cabinet installed on that pole as far as the heights concerned for that, the size of it, and then also the metering equipment that is associated with that, where that's to be located, and probably most importantly, the disconnect switch for it all. So naturally, if we have our employees, our personnel working on these poles that have a 5G antenna at the top of it, Reading Light needs a way to disable that antenna temporarily so that our employees aren't exposed to any type of harmful radiation or wireless transmission from that antenna. So each, app, each installation, each and every installation will have some type of disconnect switch that's clearly marked so that we can work on that pole safely. So the COM 35-1 has everything contained on the pole. The uh, other sheet, the COM 36-1, it's the same size pole, same class pole, same installation, but the equipment is pad mounted or remote mounted off to the side of it, which in some applications may make sense because it can't be placed on the pole. And again, you know, we have specifications regarding that equipment as far as where it can be located and the distance from the pole. But the, the town's aesthetic policy will also need to align with this regarding that equipment, what it looks like, its sizes, where it can be placed, ADA regulations that they can't violate, things of that nature. Tracy, next slide, please. Uh, here is a uh, very simple installation of a 5G wireless facility. This pole is a very clean cut pole. There's not a whole lot going on here. Uh, mostly it contains the wireless facility equipment on that pole. It does have a single phase secondary uh, lateral attached to it to provide electric service for that pole. But from what you can see here, you have all of the equipment, you have your meter, your disconnect switches down at the bottom about midway up, the larger brown box is their radio cabinet, and at the very top, that cylinder is their antenna. Now, uh, this is a standard average installation. I have seen worse and I have seen better, but this is something you can expect to see going up throughout uh, the four communities that we serve. Uh, and uh, that's it. So uh, any more questions, gentlemen and ladies? Yeah, I, got, I just got one comment. Go back one slide, if you would, please, Tracy. You know, I hope that, you know, the public sees this, and I think the aesthetics, I know Colleen mentions the CAB meetings that she's reached out to the town managers and each of the town and the aesthetics. I mean, I think it's, you know, the message that we should get across the public is the public should actually, you know, also, you know, make send a message to the town that aesthetics are very important here. I mean, I don't know if I'd be too thrilled if I saw this in front of in front of my house or where I live, you know, at this point. So I, I you know, I'm, I'm kind of speaking. I'm, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir right now, but you know, if anybody else is out there listening to this and you know is concerned about the aesthetics, I think they should you know reach out to the town and let them know on this as to yes, what. No, I agree be. with you. I I think that, uh, and it's not just one pole. It might be multiple poles all the way along the road, right? I mean, doing looking exactly like this. That's correct. Yes, absolutely. So this is this is something that could be on every single or the the vast majority of utility poles throughout the uh, service territory. Is this higher than thirty feet, by the way? Uh, this application here. Yes. Th that's a forty foot pole. So what ours ours would be thirty foot though, right? Uh, well, the majority of our poles in our service territory are higher than forty feet. Ah, okay. Okay. So. Uh, John, this is Bob again. Yes, hi Bob. I, you know, 
just as an FYI, you know, this penetration has already occurred in, you know, Medford, Lynn, Revere, Everett. Um, it's 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 on ongoing right now. So you know, it, it's uh, in multiple North Shore communities. Um, you're seeing these antennas go up already. So yeah. I think it's uh, it, it's something that you know, people will start to to notice. Um, on a more regular basis, and, and these things, are, you know, they communicate. Their range is about 500 feet, um, and they are they are targeting high, you know, high traffic areas first, right? That's right. Low Street, that that that's the traffic area, but um, they they, yeah. they are everywhere. Bob, John, can I ask a question of Bob? Please go ahead. Bob, have you heard any complaints about the aesthetics in those towns? Anybody? Um, I, I, the aesthetic, um, not not so much surprisingly. I think the the issue becomes where if you try to move one of these, um, because they the, they're designed to be where they are by an RF engineer, and 140 feet matters. You know, 150 feet between pole spans does matter. Um, so if the town agrees to a location, and the you know the engineers agree to a location, and then you go out and you find that you need to move it for some reason. I, I see that comes up more as a, an issue than than aesthetics does, but um, they, you know these things are predetermined where they need to be. Um, so right. I, I think. You know. John, can Thanks. I add some? Yes, please go ahead, Colleen. Um, so just to add on to what John says, uh, the communication is really important with the towns. Um, I think you all know that I sent out our master agreement and technical specifications to each of the towns. We are hoping to do a Zoom call with them. I just talked to the cab about, about this. Um, we did our phone call with Reading uh, first because um, the towns require to have an aesthetic policy and the town of Reading had gotten a copy of a policy and adopted it from Burlington, Mass. And the issue with that is Burlington is not an MLP territory. So the aesthetic policy doesn't really dovetail into our master agreement. For example, if the aesthetic policy says, you know, these should not be put on poles that are greater than 30 feet, but most of the utility poles are 40, 45 feet, then you could see that there's already going to be an issue. Um, John and I, we said that we would help to review these, but it's really up to the town's council to provide them with, with an aesthetic document. I am reaching out to the town of Norwood because that would be a more applicable aesthetic policy that maybe uh, I can send as example. And I have, have sent other examples of MLP ter territory aesthetics to the towns. We do need to have a permit from a town saying that AT&T Verizon has a permit to be in the right of way, no different from, Verizon, from Comcast. So you will not see any of these things go up if there's no permit from the town. So just, and the, because the communication is so important, if somebody's hearing something that doesn't sound right, you know, RMLD said no, you, somebody needs to call me because we're going to be really communicating to prevent that from happening. We don't want any issues. There are wireless companies out there whose business model is to own their own pole. They have no want to attach to an existing pole. They want their own pole. They might want to rent antennas from the top. And I don't want it to come across that, that RMLD is not being, uh, you know, supportive or compliant. We are really trying to make sure that we minimize any additional polls where we can uh, and work with each of the towns. So just wanted to add that. The, the master agreement, as I wrote in the email, is substantially complete. We have some issues like a motor vehicle hits the pole. It's a Verizon RMLD pole and the antenna comes down. So clearly the wireless company wants us to take full responsibility for their equipment on our pole. So there's some liability issues that we have to nail down and other things, but for the most part, they're just about complete, but we don't have any signed contracts yet. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Colleen. And John, thank you very much. This is very, very informative. It's my pleasure, thank you. Okay, if we could move on to the uh, integrated resources, uh, Chuck.
Okay. <clears throat> Good evening. So, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to begin this evening with uh, just an update on what's going on with the load. Uh, I know that uh, one of the concerns is uh, how we're being impacted by COVID-19. And uh, I've got the first seven months of 2020 here and wanted to point out that uh, while we experienced uh, low loads, uh, lower than forecasted loads in the early part of the year, June and July, we've actually experienced loads uh, greater than uh, what was forecast. We're currently running about 3% uh, below uh, our forecast, but what we're not seeing is the uh, anticipated uh, load reductions uh, as COVID-19 impacts. So. <clears throat> Uh, the early part of the year, the loads are down because it was uh, warmer and we didn't have quite as many heating degree days uh, to deal with. The uh, second part uh, of this shows that uh, it's been warmer during the summer and so we've had more cooling degree days and our loads are actually up over uh, what was projected. So all in all, uh, we seem to be holding our own uh, at this point. Um, Next slide, please, Tracy. The, um, the next couple of slides are, are the repeats of the, uh, the purchase power uh, expenses, the overall uh, purchase power, the energy capacity uh, and transmission. I don't wanna spend uh, a lot of time with them. Uh, it's uh, pretty straightforward and uh, we've been going along uh, as we uh, anticipated uh, pretty much uh, in the budget. So uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, the energy costs, which are about 80% of our budget have been tracking very closely. Um, if we can uh, go to the uh, next one. Um, Capacity costs uh, coming in a little bit uh, lower uh, than was. Uh, Chuck, you froze, I think. Uh, budgeted. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of this uh, capacity cost is going to have it come up. Am I back now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we've got our capacity costs. Um, those are set uh, mostly the year before, uh, but uh, because loads are down, uh, we've been seeing uh, a little bit of uh, reduction in uh, the uh, peaking costs for the year. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is transmission. This is uh, where we see uh, probably the most real-time benefit from uh, the peak shaving activities that we have uh, in place. Uh, our generator, our uh, battery energy storage system, and the Shred the Peak program uh, that we've been running, uh, those produce essentially real-time transmission uh, benefits for us. And uh, as you can see, uh, we're doing fairly well uh, with the May and June uh, results in terms of uh, what we were expecting to see, even with the uh, higher heating loads. So uh, next, please. Uh, this slide um, is fairly interesting in that if you take a look at uh, January, February, March, and April, uh, we actually had sales back to the pool which is in keeping with the fact that our loads uh, were lower than anticipated. So we had uh, more resources uh, than we could use internally and we sold those back. June, we remember. Uh, I think we lost you again, Chuck. Uh, on the slide, we reverse that. Our loads are up now. 
Let's put one of the first 5G poles right near Chuck's house. <laughs> John, can you make that happen? <laughs> yeah, I'm on it tomorrow. Okay. Uh, am I back now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I apologize. I'm up in New Hampshire, and uh, we haven't even gotten to 3G yet. So uh, we're running a little uh, behind here. Um, so uh, what I wanted to show with this slide is that uh, uh, June and July will be back into uh, us selling or us purchasing uh, from the market because the loads are higher than uh, we budgeted. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, I wanted to give everybody an update. Um, the energy bills uh, passed uh, this year, H4933 and Senate 2500. Uh, because of the mismatch between the two, uh, they have gone to conference committee. Uh, what was originally filed uh, a little over a year ago as the golden bill uh, was incorporated into H4933 and is part of Roadmap 2050 legislation. The uh, conference committee to resolve the differences between the uh, energy legislation uh, packages passed in the House and the Senate uh, has six members on it. Five of those members uh, serve municipal uh, light plant communities. The sixth member of the committee is uh, Representative Golden, who actually supported the bill. So we're hopeful uh, that the Clean Energy Standard uh, Bill uh, will come through the conference committee. The conference committee on um, hiatus uh, pending the um, September primaries, and then uh, they will come back and do their work. Uh, we're expecting that that will be completed in September. When it's completed, uh, it will be effective upon the signature of the government, of the governor, and um, basically uh, the Golden Bill made it through relatively intact, so the MLPs uh, got what uh, they had uh, hoped for. Uh, in the legislation that was uh, filed a year and a half ago. So, um, next slide, please. This is a repeat of a slide that was put up uh, last month. Uh, I just pulled the other uh, compliance standards off so that uh, we could see uh, what the compliance and golden bill looks like and what our portfolio uh, is structured. The um, right-hand side uh, of this. Uh, excuse me, Chuck. Uh, someone's got some uh, noise in the background. Might you uh, mute your phone, please? Thank you. Go ahead, Chuck. Okay. Um, basically, uh, what this shows is that uh, municipal light plants are on a uh, steeper curve in the early years. Uh, from 2021 to about 2030. At that point, uh, the municipal light plants uh, have uh, caught up with the requirements of uh, the clean energy standard, and uh, we would be on the same path to achieve what uh, the investor-owned utilities are achieving, which is the 80% uh, carbon-free emissions by 2050. So uh, what you're looking at with uh, the portfolio for RMLD, the light blue, uh, the medium blue, the dark blue, and the green uh, is the combination of resources uh, currently under contract uh, with RMLD and for which we control the RECs. So we can put together uh, composite packages to uh, make sure that we comply with the uh, requirements of the Golden Bill, and we're in pretty good shape to be able to do that through 2034. So we have about 12 years of um, resources that we've actually got under contract uh, that we can use for uh, compliance purposes. Uh, next slide, please. Can I ask, oh, go ahead. I just had a quick question when you get a chance. 
uh, on this slide, previous slide? Yeah, it was on the previous slide in the golden build trajectory. Okay. So what is it that is your understanding of the bill that's now kind of on track and that what, what does it require us to do uh, by 2030? Well, this would be the um, compliance year by year that we would uh, need to meet and we would have to have uh, some combination of uh, non-carbon emitting resources uh, where we would have the RECs or the EFECs uh, as a combined package uh, meet that uh, level of uh, non-carbon emissions in our portfolio. But what is that level? What percentage? Uh, that level uh, percentage changes um, year to year. Yeah, but 2030 is, it sets a target for 2030, right? Okay, the, th the target for 2030 uh, is roughly uh, 300 out of 700. Uh, so it's probably about 40%. All right, because I'm, I mean, I, I, my understanding is that a bill passed the House on July 31st. Um, that, that is, is correct. Now, and that that bill is, uh, requires us to reach, and it's going to, and my understanding is it's going to be the bill, and then it requires us to reach 50% by 2030. Um, so I just want to be clear about, it kind of goes back to the original the comment at the beginning of the meeting is what is it that the law makes us do and how is it different, different if at all, from IOUs? So my understanding is under this, and the bill is actually, um, is H4912, Section 15 says that we, and it passed a couple of weeks ago, says we have to meet 50% non carbon emitting by 2030 and 75% by 2040. And also, it also gets us out of the having to worry about this whole rec political issue because it doesn't, it, 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 we can sell them if we want to, but that will, that will not be able to count the sold. The, the electricity for which Rex has been sold, we will not be able to count that as renewable energy under the de definition of this law. So it, it means we don't have to worry about the politics of that anymore. We just have to worry about what our numbers are. That's my understanding. And my further understanding of it is that this bill that is passed allows us to count nuclear as our non-carbon, which is great. And that the difference between this and what the IOUs have to do is they, that they can't count nuclear if they use it. And that, and, and we are about 15% nuclear. So I believe that I may be wrong that the net difference of all this is that we're able to count 15% of our portfolio as being non-carbon, but the IOUs are not. So, but we still have to hit 50% 50, 50 in uh, eight and a half years with 15% of that already in the can with nuclear plus a few percent that we already have that's renewable uh, certified. That's my, that's my understanding and I hope that's correct and if it is, that it's helpful. Just to kind of everybody to understand where, where we are in the Since law. Since such a recent uh, passing, I suggest we, uh, we go back and take a look at that bill. I think that, that's great input, Dave, thank you. And okay, I'll send the link along to this bill and, but I, I gather that this is what it's gonna be. So. Sounds like it would be good news for us. I mean, it certainly, if it, if, if this bill is, is the bill that is going to pass and be signed by the governor, then it certainly clears up all these different confusing things of, well, what might we be required to do? And what if it's this? What if it's that? It's like, well, here it is. We've got a law now. And then, okay, there's the law. And then it's just how are we going to comply with it and, and at what rate? And it looks like, um, Chuck, you've got us on a straight line where we go, you know, we go a straight line from here to 2030 to hit that 50%. So then it's just a question of how are we doing that? Um, and maybe the board can be involved in, you know, helping on the, just, you know, make help make those decisions on what we want to be doing from here to 2030 to hit that 50%. Can, can I interject? I think. Yes, please. Please, Colleen, go ahead. Um, the bill that's passing is the one that the municipal light plants uh, put in to the legislation. So 
you know, our recommendation for the sustainable policy 30 is to follow the golden bill. We are just waiting for the nuances of that bill to be uh, decided. Um, so that's part of what Chuck is trying to explain exactly what we're recommending for the policy and how we would meet those goals was not really what we were presenting tonight because we're still waiting for that to come out. That's where the policy is coming from that we're hoping that you will vote on in September. Okay, so, uh, I'll send so, along the bill that passed on the 31st of July. So it seems there's a confusion between the two bills, right? Between the golden bill uh, uh, definition. I think that, the, I think this is the bill. It incorporates elements of what was the golden bill, but this is the bill. Okay. I, I may be wrong. I'll just I'll send it ar around and somebody can correct uh, if it's wrong. But just so that I'm just sharing what I've learned, and I could be wrong, but I think this is correct. But no, actually, Dave, you're you're, you you are correct. That is the the bill. Um, Tracy, can you go to slide eight, please? So what was passed in the legislature in the House was Bill H4933. That's the House's energy bill. That includes, yeah. among other things, what the original golden bill that got rolled up into H4933. The Senate energy bill is S5500. And those two okay. bills have gone to a conference committee three senators, three representatives to be uh, ironed out. And what comes out of that conference committee will be the energy legislation. So we're waiting for that to come through. Pieces of the bills may fall out uh, as the House and the Senate uh, do some negotiations, but uh, Dave is right, H4933, is what contains the guidance that we have been waiting for. Uh, and as soon as that is passed, we will understand uh, what is expected of us to comply with the statutory uh, obligations. Right, I just have it as H4912. That's the bill that passed on the 31st, H4912. I'll send it around now. That'd be helpful, thank you. And let's yep. try to resolve this by perhaps the September meeting, would that be a good target? That's yeah, I mean, I think if this is about to pass, we ought to have the law pass and we know what the, what the law requires us to do. Yes. I think that's put the horse before the cart. And once we know what the law is, then I think we should be tweaking the policy. So, okay, here's the law and how are we getting there? Um, and if, you know, or exceeding if, if there's some push to do that or not. But right. I do think we need the law before we try to do a policy, but that's just me. Yep. No, I, I think the rest of the commissioners would agree with you. Yep. Okay. Okay, good. So what this uh, next chart lays out is the potential range of rate impacts from the minimum impact, which would be compliance with the new state standard up to the impact of uh, acquiring and retiring all of uh, the recs in the portfolio. So uh, this just lays out uh, on a year by year basis, uh, the range of potential impacts that we're looking at. And this is a repeat of the slide that was uh, presented previously, uh, except that I also had a couple of other uh, intermediate points in there that uh, represented the um, uh, RPS and the CES uh, standards uh, in terms of the rate impact should we attempt to uh, comply with those. So this, this is just the, the range uh, that we would be looking at. So, um, Can I ask a question, Chuck? Yeah, please, go ahead. These are just, those aren't um, compounding impacts on retail rates. No, those, those, those would be the year by year. So if we were to take 2022 and we were to uh, retire uh, the RECs um, in our portfolio, we would need to increase our rates about 4% uh, to cover that. Uh, 
we would then need another 2% in 2023 to pick up the extra margin uh, of the uh, RECs that we would have in that year. And Chuck, another question. What, what falls under biomass? What's included in biomass? Um, biomass is usually combustion of uh, green material. So if we were to have wood chips, uh, that would be a biomass uh, plant. Um, so that's kind of, okay, there's some controversy with biomass, isn't there, about whether there's that's There's controversy really a with biomass and with methane combustion from landfill. Um, biomass would also uh, include agricultural waste. Uh, so if we were to uh, collect uh, manure on a farm, uh, we were to uh, collect renderings from a meat processing facility, uh, et cetera, we were to run it through a methane digester, uh, that would be a uh, biomass. Right. I, I, my understanding is most of the biomass is burning trees. That. That is a, a big part of it. Um, biomass has been part of uh, the renewables uh, portfolio since the renewable portfolio standard was created. It has been uh, listed as a uh, viable resource. Okay, so we have some controversy about that. I'm sure we'll, we'll address it here, perhaps moving forward. Um, you have another uh, piece here, Chuck, on the generator performance? Uh, yes, I believe slide 12. There we go. Um, what I did was I just uh, collected some information on how our um, peak demand uh, assets uh, have performed uh, to date. Uh, we have the 2020 impact, which includes uh, the uh, July uh, peak activity um, and the uh, life to date impacts from uh, each of these. So the battery energy storage system uh, has had a positive impact on our portfolio of three quarters of a million dollars. The two and a half megawatt generator has had a positive impact uh, on our portfolio of about $1.4 million. Uh, we have the two Solar Choice uh, programs. Uh, Solar Choice 1 uh, is just shy of $100,000. Solar Choice 2 uh, has an interesting history. Uh, it started out uh, as a uh, negative for the, the first couple of years, but we've been uh, positive for the last few, and we've been uh, closing that up, uh, but the total impact of our peak management activities has been two and a quarter million dollars. That's great. Hey, I got a question here. Question? If question, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, so on the, I noticed on my bill that one of the, uh, and I can't remember which one, one of the solar choices has been dropped off the bill. I'm not getting a credit like I was from before. I mean, is that, what's going on there? Uh, I believe the credit for Solar Choice 2 went to uh, zero. It has zero. It, it, one of them is um, dropped off the bill completely. Yeah. I can provide you with the uh, analysis and the backup materials for how that was calculated. Is that, Chuck, is that because we don't have enough participation or it's not? No, both yet? projects are fully subscribed. It has to do with um, the value of the capacity uh, against the uh, time that the Solar Choice project was built. Ah, okay. So was that credit ever going to come back to me or what, what's going on? <laughs> the the so, credit so. is, it's recalculated every year. Part of the problem is uh, that going forward, the uh, capacity rate is dropping rather dramatically. And uh, so if it goes to a negative benefit, we set it to zero. 
So I guess the good news here is that the uh, battery and the two and a half megawatt generator have uh, basically they're they're paying themselves back, uh, especially the generator within two years, if I re recall correctly. Yes. And the battery, of course, was a grant. So that's that was a million dollar grant, right? So we're basically very far ahead on that one. Generators are, are about a million dollars a megawatt per purchase. That battery is a beautiful thing. Sure is. Can we get another one? We are looking at uh, additional battery options as we develop uh, Solar Choice 3. And we're looking at uh, battery options associated with uh, some of the other uh, development opportunities on our distribution system. Okay, great. Thank you, Chuck. Um, there was also a, a question that had been asked uh, as to um, what we are doing with uh, some of our FERC uh, litigation activities and uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, we've um, been involved in a couple of uh, interventions at FERC uh, regarding uh, filings that have been made. Uh, there were uh, two projects uh, that came along. Uh, one uh, was Mystic Units 8 and 9, uh, which wanted uh, rather uh, significant uh, cost adjustments to remain available uh, for a four-year period. Um, and the municipals, uh, including RMLD, uh, intervened in that docket to uh, bring the uh, costing uh, down on that, uh, has probably shortened the uh, life of the Mystic units by uh, a year or so. Uh, but resulted in significant cost savings uh, from what Mystic wanted to charge uh, ISO to remain open. Uh, the other uh, docket that uh, we participated in recently, which netted us just about a tenfold uh, benefit to our investment, uh, was getting involved with uh, National Grid's formula sub-transmission rate and how Grid was incorporating uh, certain uh, of the uh, plant assets uh, into the process. And uh, we uh, intervened in that uh, and uh, were successful in pointing out to FERC that uh, some of that needed to be changed. And we came up with a side negotiation with National Grid to adjust the formula rate. So uh, that had about a 10 to one uh, return to us. Uh, in terms of managing those benefits. So um, the municipal light plants in Massachusetts do get involved with FERC regulation and we've been uh, successful over the last uh, couple of years in how we've uh, uh, participated in those dockets and what we've gotten for our efforts. We keep the IOUs honest. That's can, I, can I add a comment, John? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, our FERC uh, council is Duncan and Allen. So that's who Chuck is talking about. So ah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, that, I mean, having the fox in the hen house there is not a great thing, right? When they're uh, put adding their additional costs into their factors if you don't have a sharp pencil to kind of look at what they're doing. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Chuck. Um, I think we're moving on to the financial update, if there are no other questions. Good evening. So tonight I'm going to report on the financials for the first six months of the year ended June 30. So first I'd like to say that your first glance at the financial statements may be a little uh, daunting. Maybe it's a little scary, but uh, don't believe it. So I don't know if you recall a couple months ago, we kind of presented a reforecasted six year plan because of the compounded um, effects of the revenue that we had originally budgeted for. 
So we are right on target with the reforecast plan. As uh, Chuck has said about the kilowatt hour sales, where we said we would intend to end the year at either flat or maybe a negative 2%, and we are about a negative 1% right now as far as sales go. So if you were to look at the, if when you're reviewing the financials, if you actually look at June this year compared to June last year, you get a, a better picture where we stand. And overall, the expenses are pretty comparable. And the revenue at this time is $2 million under Purchase power, purchase power revenue is $2 million under purchase power expense. And as you know, in the past, we've talked about how it's a pass through and every month Chuck recuperates the cost from the customers through the revenue and at year end, it typically is uh, balanced out. So this month through June, it's about a $2 million difference. So that's where a little bit of the swing is that you can see, um, but I'm not, I'm not really concerned just so you know. So if you look at the cash balances here on the slide, you can see we're in a really good position. Our unrestricted funds of $22 million and total restricted funds of 27 million. If you look at uh, the sick leave benefits, 792,000, anybody who's been following along realizes that's very low as compared to uh, how it's been in the past. And I'll get into that a little further, but overall there's the pie chart of all the cash accounts total of $50 million. The next slide I wanted to focus on is our accounts receivable considering the COVID impact. Uh, every month I come up here and I tell you that we're doing great with our receivables and I did two different um, analyses. One, just the three months of the COVID impact, April to June, and then the next slide, not just yet Tracy, but the next slide you'll see the uh, total six months. So this impact, you can see April, May, June for the past three years. I just did a, a quick analysis so that you can kind of get the picture. We're, we're pretty much in line for um, April and May. And then in June is where you can see, this is 30 days current. June is where you can see that um, customers are not paying as quickly. So typically I report 90 days current, but I wanted you to see both the, the 30 days and the 90. So you can tell it's dropped about 6%. So typically we, we are at 86% for 30 days and now it's at 79%. Next slide, Tracy. And then when you look at the 90 days current, you see how it, it's, it's April and May is kind of pretty balanced. And then June is where it dips again. And it's the same, same situation. Typically it's about 98.5% current at the 90 days. And now we're at 94%. And the reason I use 90 days as a um, as kind of a, um, a measure is because of the timing effect. People don't always, you know, people who are not on auto pay, they just forget to pay their bill. It's not intentional. And typically around 90 days is a really good judge of um, who's still outstanding for real reasons and who's not. So I really like to use this as an indicator for my analysis. So I, I would say it's still, it's still fairly uh, impressive. If you think about it, 94% is, is a good number. Go on, Tracy, please. So then here we go. I just, so as I stated, the sick uh, leave buyback, I think it's a good opportunity right now to identify that um, you're aware of some of the changes that were made in the um, CBA, the bargaining labor unions, that we are allowing employees to buy back sick time. And this has been an ongoing effort that uh, Colleen has taken on with, with the board to try to uh, minimize the li sick leave liability. So you can tell the bottom is June of 2016, and that's about $3.3 million of a sick buyback liability. So you can see the, the ins and outs based on the, um, the COLA each year, based on employees leaving and, co and coming in. And we've removed the idea that you can have unlimited sick buyback. Everybody's down to 30 days limit. And if you look at our numbers at the end of June, we're down to $2.1 million in the sick, li sick leave liability. So that's pretty significant in a four year drop of $1.2 million. So uh, that shows that the, the plan is working and we're removing the liability, which means we're also removing the idea that employees uh, after have been, having been here very long, they're leaving at the rate that they're leaving at. So this is really good for the RMLD.
That's, that's good. It sounds so you're really getting that under control. That's great. Next slide, please, Tracy. So um, sorry for the, the labeling. It's a little misleading. It's not operating revenue to operating expenses. It's operating revenue to um, overhead. So maintenance, general and administrative expenses. And the reason I did this is just to show you the, the trend for January to June for three years uh, of the operating revenue going down slightly, which is also a big part to do with um, purchase power expenses decreasing. So because if the expense decreases, then the revenue will decrease. But then if you look at the blue, these are our, these are our maintenance, general and, operate, general and administrative expenses. You can tell in the three years, we're pretty stable there from 2018 to 2020, there's only an increase of about $200,000. So our expenses, the ones that we actually can control, I mean, you know, we don't have a lot of control, but we have some control, are pretty flat. So we're, we're staying very responsible and, uh, and then the revenue's coming down, but with the revenue coming down, you will start to see the revenue flatten out as we go month to month. We'll, we'll catch back up on that. So Wendy, what that uh, also tells me is that we're a fixed cost organization. Well, we have a certain basic amount of fixed costs. We have very little flexibility in terms of, you know, addressing the actual cost portion of it. So okay. it's really about what can we do to kick up the revenue, right? Right, and then we and we say that every time we present the budget, we we show you <laughs> right that. exactly. Okay, go on, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, and here we go. I just wanted to show you just the April to June impact of the same exact slide, just you know, because of the COVID impacts. Everybody's concerned and, and rightfully so. So I just want to make you understand that it's very um, it's very consistent. Same situation here. We got about a two hundred thousand dollar difference from year uh, twenty eighteen through twenty twenty, and the same kind of trend. So nothing outside of you know it's nothing scary. It's nothing you know everybody's pretty much on track. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Yeah, I think that's so. Overall, we got a. Uh, Negative operating income about two hundred sixty thousand dollars, but I am confident with the purchase power expenses that we will level out and we'll we'll be back in the positive in no time. Thank you. Excellent. Any questions from uh, from anyone? If not, uh, could we move to uh, Hamid to your engineering and operations report? Yes. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to present you the construction projects and. The projects that are currently under the way and uh, the recently completed projects. The first slide, you see that we got that big uh, conversion project that is going on in Linfield Center, starting from Linfield Center, uh, continuing down the Lowell and uh, North Main Street area. Approximately there are 54 poles that are, uh, they are involved. We are upgrading everything, primary, secondaries, and the transformers in that area. And by doing that project, actually, we're going to reduce the distribution losses, which is good. That means it's saving money, saving us money. And we've got a few more projects like that, that, you know, the step-down areas that we still, uh, you know, got, we got to do the conversion. So uh, the next one is the next area that uh, we're making improvements is phase two of the Marion Street in Wilmington. That's a line ex extension. Uh, we uh, approximately replaced 2,100 feet of underground cable, and uh, we uh, we uh, installing actually 3,000 feet of the three-phase overhead uh, on the pole lines. It involves 26 poles, and we are upgrading the H transformers as well as the replacing or upgrading the uh, secondary mains and the services. So this project is uh, ongoing and we expect that to be completed by end of the year. So that's gonna be another uh, big uh, undertaking for the, for the line group. Uh, the next one is the Parkview Road in Reading area. That's again involving the replacing and upgrading the two transformers uh, <clears throat> for the load optimization, for service load optimization, upgrading the primary conductors and electrical facilities uh, to new poles, as you could see in the picture on the far on the far left, uh, you know there are some of open wires. Actually, the picture right in the middle it shows you those open uh, open wires secondaries. That these are really the old constructions 
and the new construction is the triplex, which is right, you see on the left, uh, replaced by three wires that get twisted and it's more reliable and lower losses again, which is much, much better, especially okay. during the storms. The next uh, slide, please. Uh, the Kenwood Road in Wilmington. This is another area upgrade that involves uh, poles, primary cables, secondary transformers and services. Again, Ryzen replaced 22 poles in that area and we are upgrading everything uh, uh, from the pole to primary, secondary, everything down. And uh, 36 customers that they're, uh, they're, they're included in this project. The project is approximately 33% completed and we expect that project also to be completed by uh, December 2020. The next slide is showing the West Overdrive underground facility upgrade. Uh, these are six of the seven Padmont transformers that have been replaced and about, uh, we replaced approximately 3,000 feet of primary conductors. And that's again, another area upgrade. And we are uh, almost uh, at the end of uh, this construction and this is getting completed in about uh, a week or so. On the left, you see the transformer, the condition that it, it was, and on the right, you see the new transformer and how the, you know, the, the, the upgrade that been made. The bottom of these transformers are rusted, and, you know, these are the ones that you know, they could impact the reliability, and uh, we're addressing those uh, based on our age, the transformer replacement uh, priorities that we set and we, the studies that we do. That list is continuously being updated so we address the ones that they really need the, the attention. The next slide shows you the Green Briar Drive that, that's in North Reading, that's an underground facilities upgrade. Again, all the cables and the five of the seven transformers are replaced. The remaining two transformers, uh, they, they were in good conditions, they're less than 10 years old, so they're not replaced, they're in good working conditions. And uh, basically, we are uh, we're going to be done with this project uh, uh, also uh, uh, soon. Uh, so, and then we're going to obviously we're going to monitor those two transformers, the loading and everything, to make sure the loading stays within the within the uh, guidelines. The project pretty much is completed. There's some minor work that needs to be done, but it's for the most part the project is complete. The next uh, slide is showing you the other projects. These are the maintenance uh, and also capital authorization projects. Uh, the power factor optimization software implementations, we are going to implement that as soon as the outage management system and IVR project is completed. Right now we are still testing. Oh. And uh, uh, this thing is a little bit delayed due to the COVID-19 because the contractors, they need to come over here and, you know, program them, uh, program that and complete the testing. So that's uh, delayed. Uh, the solar capacity study, that is done. And we are currently right now preparing the operating procedure for that. And that's a very good study that shows the limits uh, of generation on every feeder. Uh, the next one is the meter replacement project that Colleen explained that that project is continuously uh, is right now being awarded to a contractor, a consultant uh, to evaluate the meter purchase options and integration of the AMI with MDM as well as you know the other components in the roadmap technology that we put together uh, five, six years ago. The Padmont switchgear upgrade uh, uh, at Industrial Park uh, these are the ones that, you know, we need to upgrade as a part of the uh, switchgear upgrade plan, which is the capital improvement projects. The switchgears that are arriving uh, in mid-August, and as soon as they arrive, we're going to get started and we're going to schedule those to uh, be replaced. The next slide is showing you the maintenance programs, the tree trimming, the inspection of feeders. We just completed an inspection of feeders. This is one of the greatest programs that you know for the that heavily impacts the reliability of the reliability and that's why our reliability is so great because we inspect all the feeders and making sure that they are in good conditions and if there are any issues that need to be addressed before the storms or before the you know the winter season uh, so we take care of those 
uh, we have replaced so far uh, 282 polls out of the 518 that failed and tested and failed. Uh, they're by failing, meaning that there is, you know, there's still life left to them, but they're not failing. They failed the test for the sake of, you know, uh, putting them, scheduling them for replacement, but we still got time to uh, replace those. So 280 of those have been replaced, um, and uh, about 263 of the 282 uh, polls, they have been, the transfer has been completed on those. So we're just getting, though we're making progress on those, we're getting to the rest of them as uh, we're going through these uh, uh, areas with the upgrades. The infra scan, that's another great program. They haven't seen any hotspots. Uh, primary metering testing, that's delayed due to the COVID-19 travel restrictions. The contractor annex there is uh, based out of the Illinois and they're contracted to come and do this project for us. However, because of the testing and it might be more and more cost to them if they test positive coming over here and they need to be quarantined for 14 days, the contractor they, they want to wait until those restrictions are removed. So uh, this is delayed, but uh, they're still honoring the contract and you know we, we're safe there. The manhole inspection that's ongoing as a result of that, you know, the, the, that inspection, we, uh, we found uh, about 30 manholes that you, we have a bid that uh, at the end of this presentation, you're going to be voting on in order to fix those manholes that the, the chimney wall is broken and they need attention. So that's the result of this manhole inspection program, which is good. Uh, the porcelain cutout, that's ongoing because as we go through these uh, the, uh, area upgrades, we're replacing them, there are not many left. So uh, they're taken care. So that completes the maintenance program. Next slide is showing you the age transformer replacement programs. Basically on the chart on the right, it shows you that you know 38% of the overall uh, transformers in the system, we got about 4,600 of those. Uh, they're still in the 25 years uh, of age. It doesn't mean the transformer is going to fail, but it means that it's going to the maintenance program and prioritized based on the age for replacement. Uh, the chart on the left, it shows you that to date we have replaced approximately 48 uh, single-phase transformer, four three-phase transformer, and uh, about nine uh, padmont transformers. So total is 61, which is, you know, last year this time we were approximately about 80, 90, uh, you know, uh, so we're a little bit behind because of the COVID-19, but we are catching up with all these, uh, you know, uh, upgrade area upgrades that we're doing through December. The next slide. This slide shows you basically the capital spendings uh, uh, through the month of June. Uh, the year to date is uh, $3.6 million and budget was 11 and a half. As Colin explained, some of these projects, they're gonna be pushed. Uh, the substation uh, land purchase is gonna be pushed because we're still searching for the land uh, and also the meter replacement, that's another one because the technology keeps changing and you know there are new developments and more companies that they're offering the AMI solutions uh, looking into the future. We hired a consultant to look at the, the, the status quo, RMLD's status quo, and look into the future and study the road with the technology roadmap that we put together, Colin and I, we put together. So that uh, based on that, they're going to do the gap analysis and they're going to look into the future to see what the future brings and where we need uh, to go with that. So uh, as a result of that, then, you know, then obviously by the time uh, we go, we go out to bid, that's going to be, uh, we're going into the CY21. So uh, the project actually is going to be pushed to CY21 implementation once the result of the study comes out. Uh, so the remaining balance is 7.9 million approximately. So that's the status of the uh, capital spendings. Next slide. All right, on this slide, you see the double poles, uh, the engine uh, report uh, in Linfield, we got 64 poles. Uh, in North Reading, we got uh, 60, well, got, we got 14 poles, a pole box that needs to be remo re removed and two in dispute. And town of Reading, we got 23 transfers and two pole bots to remove. 
and Wilmington, we got 86. These are all, the numbers are high because of these projects that, you know, Verizon actually been very helpful. I wanna thank them for cooperating with us and, you know, setting those poles. Uh, and as uh, we've explained uh, uh, previously, uh, once uh, we go, as we go through these projects, the project engineers, they do the pole form and analysis for pole tension guiding calculations and uh, they design the system and they send the 605 forms to Verizon to in the Verizon set areas so they can schedule them ahead of time and it won't be the last minute thing. And that process has been really working great for us. And as soon as, you know, we do the transfers, these poles, uh, the double poles, uh, you know, the ones that uh, once everybody is done transferring, we're going to remove the pole butts in our pole set areas and Verizon is going to take care of theirs in their pole set areas. The next slide is showing their reliability indices as everybody expects. Our reliability numbers are really great. We are doing very well. And that's the result of the good maintenance and the programs and capital spendings and here, there. So all in all, it's paying off. And I'm hoping that this year again, we're gonna, we're gonna hit the ATPA's award for the fourth year. And I'm sure we're gonna get that. So uh, the reliability is good. I'm glad to report that. The next slide is showing you basically the causes of the outages. As you could see, we've had a number of weather incidents to year to date, you know, compared to the last five years. You know, the number of uh, weather incidents gone up, the wildlife uh, gone up, and uh, the equipment and still go is still lower. But some of those equipment uh, that should have been damaged as a result of the wildlife uh, uh, contact, as well as the weather issues that we've had and some of the, the motor vehicle accidents. So uh, this, uh, you might ask the question, how come with the wildlife, we have the wildlife protection, uh, you know, uh, on, on poles, on the devices, but the squirrels are smart. They go underneath and chew the wires and that, that's how they make the contact and they cause serious damages to the equipment once they do that. The next slide. This is the showing the facilities projects at 230 Ashes Street. You could see that you know that deck came out really nice, beautiful. Everybody, we get lots of comments. Uh, that was Colleen's design, so good job, Colleen. <laughs> and uh, it's really good. And the parking lot is great, and the people they like it. You know, more space. So all in all, you know that the improvements to, to the building and uh, everything that these those projects are completed. So that concludes my report. If you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Yeah, thank you very much, Ami. That uh, excellent report. And, and I do have to comment every time I drive past the uh, front of RMLD and I see what, what has been done to the, the parking lot, the expanded parking and the electric car um, recharge stations, it's, it looks like a thousand percent better. Um, and it's very, very, um, can be utilized uh, as opposed to the gravel pit that used to be there. So that was uh, that was fantastic. Uh, one one question: um, Verizon replacing their poles? They're replacing their own poles, and I'm assuming a secondary question: When Verizon, uh, since half the poles in our territory are Verizon poles, I'm assuming they don't have to allow anyone else in terms of 5G onto those poles. Is that correct, John? Would you know? Yeah, so um, Verizon still has, the, they still have, there's two separate entities. There's Verizon Wireless and Verizon Business. Uh, they're considered two separate entities um, and uh, it's up to them to sign master agreements with other utility companies, but Verizon Business is still held to the same standards as everyone else with the, uh, the FCC regulations. I so see. Uh, I, I would imagine that they, they would be uh, incorporating other wireless companies into those areas, as long as Verizon Wireless doesn't wrap up the licenses first. Right, which I'm sure they will do. Yeah, they'll, they'll take a run at it. Okay, great. Uh, yes, uh, Bob. Hey, John, John I just let you know, um, they do try to manipulate Verizon will try to combine the two entities together and say, Oh, we're Verizon. So we get to use the poll. But that that was actually beaten down. 
Um, so they do need to apply uh, uh, as independent of the company. Can I add to that? Yes, please. Not to be confused with custodial area, the polls are still joint owned 50 50 Ver Verizon and RMLD. So even if Verizon is Verizon, they still have to ask the other owner of the poll, the other half of the poll, they still have to get our permission. I didn't realize that. That's that's a very good comment. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, what one other question, John, if I may? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, when, when Hamid mentioned engines, um, you know, having making sure that whoever is asking to be on the poll becomes a member of engines. Is that one of the requirements that RMLD is putting on that entity? It should, it should be in the agreements expli explicitly just to make sure that, you know, if something does happen and you have an emergency transfer situation that, or, or a transfer situation after the fact that they are a member of engines. So the ball in court goes to them. So it should, that's something that you should add, add to your agreement. That's a that's, good point, Robert. I'm writing an email now. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. Yes, you should include them. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I know. As, I know. As, far as, the, as far as the polls, John, that you you mentioned, yes. yeah, the Verizon they're setting in their own uh, set area. You know, they have the Reading and uh, the the Wilmington and Linfield is their set area. So and uh, because they're short staff too during the COVID-19, I mean we anticipated that. That's why we send those six or five phones well ahead of time to make sure they have ample time to schedule them. And okay. they've been doing an awesome job. We're really happy with the way that. Good. That's excellent. But set area is separate from ownership. That's all no. I was trying to point That's out. Right. Uh, Phil, could we? Uh, you, could you please read the motion? Yeah. Very good. I'll move the IFB 2020-25 for excavation and repairs of, of electric utility manholes be awarded to Zin, Kim Zanelli Excavating LLC for total cost $129,750 pursuant to Mass Chapter Law, Mass General Laws Chapter 30, Section 39M as the lowest responsible and eligible bidder on the recommendation of General Manager. Second. Any discussion? Okay. Do you want me to tell you exactly what it is? This project? Just, yeah, just very briefly. I saw the previous uh, uh, piece of paper that showed they were significantly lower than anybody yeah, else. Yeah, they're significantly lower. They're we actually sent the bid out to uh, approximately 20 companies and only three bids were received. The lowest responsible, responsive, responsive bidder was uh, Tim Zinelli's excavating LLC for 129750 These are the 30 chimneys that, you know, the manholes that we inspect during the inspection, we found out problems with them, uh, that they're collapsing or they're, you know, they need a, they, they're in need of the repair. So uh, that's why this is a project. And in the capital authorization uh, budget for last year, we budgeted $165,000. So actually this bid came out uh, lower than 165,000 that was estimated, approximately 130,000. So uh, there, we, we're gonna take care of those as soon as you know the board approves uh, uh, this bid and award, we can award them. Thank you, Hamid. Uh, You're welcome. Roll call vote. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob, please, with discussion. You're on mute, Bob. You're on mute, Bob. <laughs> oh, sorry. What was the next closest bid? If it's significantly lower, if we're talking, that that's a little scary sometimes, right? When you get a low bid, <laughs> you, it, it, you get what you pay for, right? Absolutely, it's it's scary. Um, so, actually, two of the bids they were very close, Bob. Uh, Tasco Construction came out. Uh, that was the uh, next higher. Uh, was one hundred thirty-two thousand. Oh, so. It's, so yeah, the, okay. very close. One, the, the other ones I was referring to were two hundred and fifty thousand or so. Yeah, the, sure. Then and the other one was two hundred fifty-six thousand seven hundred thirty bob. And that was fishing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, can I call for a roll call vote, please, Mr. Stempak? I. Mr. Hennessy, I. Albert, I. Golder, I. Excellent. Please uh, show in the minutes uh, unanimous vote. Mr. Chair, if I may add one more thing that yes, uh, please. I wanted to add. 
Yeah, Colin and I, we're working on a, a land prospect, land prospect for the substation. Uh, oh. And uh, the letter of intent, we're preparing the letter of intent in order to send it to the landowner that we can discuss in more in detail uh, the executive session to show you exactly where we're talking about. But uh, as a part of that process, we've been diligently looking for uh, the parcel that could be a good substation site, as well as, you know, probably adding uh, uh, battery storage and uh, solar. Uh, ah, you know, so. Excellent. Okay, good. Um, Thank you. In, in terms of the next RMLD board meetings, uh, Thursday, September 17th, uh, is that on, is uh, everyone okay with that? Yeah. Um, no could we, could we alter it slightly? To watch. Can we either do a different day that week or the, the following week? Does that cause a problem for anybody? Yeah, I'm I'm probably out the following week. About a different day. Uh, I assume that's on a, that's Thursday. So, does uh, Wednesday uh, or Tuesday work for people? Uh, Tuesday, September the fifteenth. That is not going to work for me. Okay. We're down to Wednesday <laughs> or Monday. I mean, yeah, Monday. Yeah. How about Wednesday, Phil? 16th. Wednesday. Yeah, I, I think Wednesday could is doable. Doable. Okay, let's put it down as Wednesday. And if anybody has any objections, we'll circulate uh, and try to do uh, do something different. But for now, let's assume Wednesday. That works Thanks. for me. Great. Excellent. And so uh, a grace committee, uh, that would be the day for you as well. Wednesday, the 16th. Wednesday, the 16th is an ideal for me, but I can make it work. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then uh, the next one would be on Thursday, October 22nd. We can decide that at the next meeting as well. The next cab meeting in September, uh, Mr. Hennessy, you're the, uh, the person to attend that, but if, We'll have to let them know that perhaps they should move it to the 16th, if possible, if you're supposed to be the person, or perhaps I could switch with you for uh, that day. Actually, actually, if they, they attend it by, they do it through Zoom. So I found it very easy to attend the meeting tonight. As a matter of fact, I emailed Tracy, I think, an hour only before the meeting. So I don't think it's a real problem. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that Dave has a conflict on that, on that Thursday. Uh, okay. So if he's got a conflict, either I switch with him uh, or they, they have moves to Wednesday. Uh, and I don't know, we haven't. George, what do you think? Is the cab do Wednesday or you prefer Thursday? Uh, well, we are set for that Thursday, but we'll have to. Okay. I don't want to answer. We'll figure it out. I, I might even, um, my conflict's a little bit later that night, so I might be able to still do that cab. Okay, that'd be great. If you get a problem, Dave, let me know and I can cover it for you. Okay. okay, good. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, move into executive session. Uh, could I have a motion? Yep, very good. Move that the uh, board go into executive session to consider the purchase of real real property and return to regular session. Second, please. Second. Okay, great. Let's uh, roll call vote. Mr. Stanback, aye. Mr. Messino, aye. That is the aye. Talbot. Excellent. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, very good meeting. I look forward to our next one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.